Um, hello, everyone. I'm Catherine, and welcome to DN Learning Center at Coastman Harbor Lab. Today, we're going to learn something very interesting because it's related to each one of us. Okay. I would like to welcome you to DNA Learning Center at Coastal Harbor Lab. Maybe this is your first time here. Maybe you never heard about us before. Coastal Harbor Lab, in my opinion, is one of the best place for molecular biology research. We were called the, uh, here, this is the place, people call it uh, birthplace for modern molecular biology. We have eight Nobel Prize winners today here and we have a lot of innovative science education programs for people at different level so for you if you're interested come back again all right so today we're going to learn something very interesting why look at this picture it's American people we live in America if you look around People look different. We have different skin color, different hair color, different eye color. Have you ever wondered how we related to each other? Is there a way to answer this kind of big question? Yes. One time, Dr. James Watson said famously, DNA is information. DNA has a very interesting structure. Okay, Dr. Watson got his Nobel Prize because he helped to figure out double helix is a structure for molecular uh, for DNA molecule. The here is a model of the DNA, and if you open it up, it's more like a letter. And the backbone is made of phosphate sugar, and in the middle is the base pair. A, T, C, G, made up of the DNA sequence. That's where we store the information. We call DNA as the code for life. Why? Because most of the, because DNA is a very important function. DNA can be transcribed into RNA, and RNA can be translated into proteins, and proteins give us traits. That's why we call DNA is a code for life. Now, DNA is interesting because we got it from our parents, and our parents got their DNA from their parents. So it's been passed on within your gener uh, family, generations to generations. So we call it a uh, material. Now, question for you. Where can you find your DNA? Very good. This is you can look. Inside the nucleus, you have 23 pairs of chromosome. And then outside the nucleus, there's the mitochondria, and mitochondria has mitochondria DNA. They're different. Mitochondria DNA you got only from your mom. Now, how big is human genome? Very good. 3.2 billion. It's quite big. Now, answer this question if you can. Guess what's the percentage of the DNA actually coded for protein? 10%? 5%? Actually, it's about 1%. That means most of the DNA, they're called non-coding DNA. For a while, scientists uh, were puzzled. They said, why we have so much non-coding DNA or junk DNA there? It doesn't make sense you pass down something junk generation to generation. So a lot of scientists trying to look at into this non-coding DNA and figure out why we have it. Now, there are a lot of things going on there now. We found actually a lot of, even they're not coded for protein, but they're regulatory DNA. They're very important for our well being. We have uh, all kinds of different things. Today, we're going to focus on one type of non coding DNA. We call it a transposome. 
Before we start, I would like to introduce you a concept called, called polymorphism. Okay, so what's that mean? Poly means multi, right? Polymorphism means um, giving one particular location in your genome, different people could have different sequence. What caused it? Deletion can cause it, mutation can cause it, insertion can cause it. All right, so today we're going to learn something very interesting called the jumping genes, where people now change the name to uh, transposons or jumping elements, okay? To see that, we have to pay over respect to a scientist uh, who worked at Cosmon Harbor Lab for many decades. Her name is Barbara McClintock. When she was working here, uh, at the lab, she was trying to answer one simple question. Have you ever seen a Indian corn during the Halloween season? In one ear of the corn, different kernels could have different colors. Barbara Macklin talked just trying to answer why. She found interesting thing is there's a piece of DNA actually can change their location. Let's say this is a gene for uh, the purple pigment and actually a small piece of the DNA can jump into this pigment gene and change the expression pattern. That's how you end up has Corns look like that. At the beginning, nobody um, pay attention to her discovery. But later on, more and more scientists found not just in the plant cells, DNA can change their location, but in animal cells, even in human cells, we have DNA changing their location all the time. Okay, so now we found um, there are two different uh, methods for a transposon to change their location. One is called uh, cut and paste. So in this situation, a piece of DNA will remove itself, insert it, it into a different location. The second mechanism for trans Poson to change the location is called copy and paste mechanism. In this situation, a piece of DNA need help. A special enzyme will help it first uh, transcribe into a piece of RNA and that RNA will go to a different location and with another uh, enzyme's help will uh, insert a piece of DNA into the new location. Today we're going to learn uh, some transposon called ALU. ALU, we call it a fossil because uh, during the evolution it's been jumped uh, for many times. And uh, when it jumps into a new location, it will stay there and fossilized. So scientists have figured out we can use ALU, this special piece of jumping gene, as ancestry information to figure out how the population related to each other. Now, because ALU keep jumping and accumulating, use the copy paste uh, mechanism. That's why in human genome, we accumulate about 1 million copies of it right now. It's about 10% of the whole human genome. And, um, it could be uh, passed on from generation to generation. And so uh, you could have um, the insertion where you could have not have the insertion. So there's possible, there are two possible alleles, positive and negative. Different allele frequency was found in different modern population. As I mentioned, we have about 
in copies of this ALU um, accumulated in our genome. We only have one hour here, so we're not going to check all the um, different locations. Um, we're going to focus on one locus. It's in chromosome number 16. We call it um, PV92 locus. PV92 itself is a 450 pair in length. And so if you, uh, so let's see. Don't have ALU jumped into it, so the PV92 locus um, size is 415 base pair. Well, if you have the ALU jumped into this PV92 location, that means additional 300 base pair is added to there. So you will the size will change. to 715 base pair length, all right? Okay, so how could we use that information to figure out the ancestry situation? Now, let's say about 200,000 years ago, there are a bunch of people on Earth, okay? And let's say one of the people got this ALU into PV92 uh, chromosome 16, this special location and it's in fossilized in the germline cells and then he could pass down to his children. Now let's see, um, so this, uh, this person will have um, children. Oh, let me just let's see, okay. They, everybody, oh, everybody will have children, okay. So this person will have children too, right? Sorry, I'm, okay, anyway, let's just uh, try again. This one, okay, oh, okay. Okay, there are a bunch of uh, second generation from this first generation, and because this person has this marker and fossilized, so all his children or her children will have this ALU insertion. Okay? And the other people's children, they don't. So if you check the modern population, you just need to find out whoever has this marker, then you know 200,000 years ago, they all related to that person. They all coming from that ancestor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's see if you want to do this experiment to check out if you have this alu insertion at your chromosome number 16 pv92 locus how are you going to do this experiment very good let's figure out a plan together definitely you need your dna okay so where can you get your dna very good from your cells so we're going to collect cells and then extract DNA from your cells. As I mentioned, we're just interested in that particular locus. We're not going to check all the genomes. So is there a method for you to use so uh, to amplify a small piece of DNA in a very short time? Yes, very good. It's called PCR. So we're going to learn about PCR and use that to amplify PV92 locus. And then we're going to check the result and figure out what's your genotype. That's it. So simple and straightforward. All right. So that's the plan. We meet together. All right. Let's go for it. All right. So the first thing is we need to collect over cheek cells. For cheek cells, we use something called water. It's 0.9% um, sodium chloride. And so you're going to need about 10 milliliter. So I just measure it here. Okay, that's all you need. And then you pour it into a cup. All right, and then you use that to wash your mouth. Okay, it may look funny, so I'm not going to do it in front of you. Or should I? Okay, I will do it. You have to wash your mouth for one minute and then you put it back into your cup. The next 
you are going to use the macro pop header to measure and transfer 1,000 microliter of, some, of the mouthwash water into the small centrifuge tube. All right, so how to use macro pop header? So macro pop header is just like a dropper you use at home. Scientists use this um, fancier equipment uh, than dropper because this can measure a small amount more precisely. All right, so now I change the volume to 1,000. So that's the amount of volume I'm going to measure. Okay, and I price down to the first stop. You see there's a uh, button here. You price to the first stop, then you get into the liquid. And then you're going to slowly release your thumb all the way up. There you go, you got 1,000 microliter mouthwash water. And then you're going to put it into the tube. Price down all the way to the second stop. So you squeeze all the liquid out, okay? And you back out and change the tape. There you go, so now you can see there's 1,000 microliter mouthwash water. Now, can you see the cells? No, you can't. But do you want to see your cells or my cells? Okay, so how could we separate the cells from the water so that we can see them? Okay, we can use something called a centrifuge. So here, I have a centrifuge here. And when you open it up, you can put your tubes there. When you put the tube there, make sure you balance your tubes. Okay, so what's that mean? That means, um, just imagine you go to the playground, okay? And you're here, you need a partner to balance you, okay? So that's how we use the centrifuge. I put my tubes here and the, with the balancer, and then I put the cover there. And, all right, can you see that? All right, then I'm closing it and press the button. So after you centrifuge your mouthwash water for one minute, and then you can see the cells separate from the water at the bottom. All right, um, after that, you just need to remove most of the water um, from the tube so that you can concentrate the cells, cell solution, okay? All right, so um, I'm just pretending it's finished, okay, for, to save the time, all right? Okay. Now, your cells should be at the bottom of this uh, tube. Okay, then what you need to do is you're going to open it up and turn the tube upside down so that you can remove most of the water out. And you still have a little bit left there, then you close the cap and then you mix it again. This way you concentrate the, uh, the cells. All right, so next step, you need to extract the DNA from your cells. How to extract DNA? That's a good question. There's so many different ways, but I'm going to introduce you the easiest way. Hit it up, okay? So what we need to do is we, I have this tiny tube called the Kilex tube. So you can see in the tube, there are two layers. At the bottom, this is Kilex. Kilex are negative charged beads. So I'm going to add 30 microliter of this cell solution into the Kilex tube. For this time, I'm using the yellow button macro pipetter because this one measures up to 100 microliter. And I need a 30, so I changed the reading to 0300. That's 30 microliter. Then I press down to the first stop and I get 30 microliter. And I add it 
into the calyx tube. Like that. Then I'm going to use the machine. This is the thermal secular. I can change the um, temperature. So for my for this step, I change I set up a program called Boil. And here the temperature you can see it's 99 Celsius degree for 10 minutes. That's a program I set up here. All right. Then I just put the Kilax tube there, close it, and then start to run it. Okay. All right. Now you can see it's boiling. Okay. Now, here's two questions for you to think. First of all, why I was using 0.9% saline water rather than just the tap water or some other concentration? Why? Okay, you got it. Yes, I gave the answer here. So because that's isotonic solution. Isotonic solution, they are, they, they're harmful, uh, ha harmless. So they won't break your cells. If you use hypotonic or hypertonic, it's not good for your cells. That's why we use this just to make you, all right? Now, Next question is how, what, so remember I asked you how many different ways you can use to extract DNA, all right? I use the easiest way, which is boiling. Is there any other way? Yes, I love the answer. So you can uh, do some research um, after we finish here how many different ways you can get the DNA out of the cells, all right? Now, for today, we use the simple list way. We boiled it up, okay? Now, why boiling can help us extract DNA? That's right. So if you go to the structure of the cells, you know, the cell membrane and organelles, everything. So when you heat it up, what's changed? Yeah. So it's like you, the back, if you imagine the cells is the back, you heat it up, you destroy the cell membrane, then you release everything inside the cells into the tube. Okay, now inside the tube, what do you have now? You will have everything released from the cells, right? You will have DNA, you will have organelles, you will have cell membrane, you will have RNA, you will have cations, a lot of things. But remember next time, next step for us is we're going to do PCR. To do PCR, we need pure DNA, okay? So how could we clean the DNA, separate the DNA from the garbage, separate the DNA from the cell membrane, from the cell organelles, from other things? Yeah, there are many ways we can do that. But today I'm just going to use the easiest way. I'm going to use the equipment we used uh, in the previous step to separate the things. What is that equipment? Do you remember? Very good. It's centrifuge, right? So after I finish this step, I'm going to, uh, that's just a pretending. Uh, we finish this step, okay? So I will get this out. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to uh, centrifuge it. Now, this tube is way smaller than this tube. So when you use the centrifuge, centrifuge machine, you need something called adapter. So it's like a Russian doll toys, okay? You have the big tube and medium sized tube and the smallest tube fit there perfectly. So what you need to do is you're going to um, put this Kilex uh, 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 tubes in the adapter and then put them into the centrifuge. Again, you need to balance your tubes and then do this step. All right, just like this. Okay. 
So because the time matters, I'm not going to show you uh, exactly um, how it's done, but you know the idea. You guys are smart and you know what's going to happen. All right, so after we finish this, um, we're going to get the DNA. So question for you. Now this is your Kilax tube. It's a beads with negative charge. Now where is your clean DNA? Very good. Your DNA is negative charged, so they should be away from the Kilax tube. Kilax at the bottom. And they're small molecules, so they are at the top of the supernatant. Okay, so next step, what we need to do is something called a PCR. Okay, now we just need two microliter of your DNA add into the PCR tube for that reaction. So we are going to use the gray button macro pipetter. Okay, I set up to zero two uh, zero zero. Okay, and we're going to get the Kilax. So here's your Kilax tube. Open it up, press down to the first stop, and you just touch the surface of the supernatant, then you draw. All right, that's two microliter. Very tiny amount, but it's enough for your PCR. And here is a PCR tube. I have all the regions there beside your DNA template, okay? Then you just add this into the tube like that, and then you put it back into the PCR machine. Okay, the PCR machine, uh, let's just say, we save a program here the beat and then you put it there and then start that's how we run PCR okay so what is PCR I have a little animation video we made here at DNA Learning Center to explain it to you polymerase chain reaction or PCR uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the primed sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. Okay, so after that video, you understand what do we need for PCR? Let's work it together, okay? What do you need? Very good, you need polymerase rays. That's in the name, right? What else do you need? DNA template, very good. And to make a copies of DNA, what else do you need? Yes, free nucleotide. 
What else? Very good. Primers. Okay. And there's an, one more thing. You didn't get it from the uh, video, but it's very important. It's called a buffer. So buffer will give the right pH and something called magnesium, which is a helper for the enzyme to work. Okay. That's what you need for PCR. All right. In today's um, experiment, we set up a special program, uh, 30 cycles of um, 94, 30 seconds, 68 degree, 30 seconds, and 72 um, degree for 30 seconds. And the primer we're using is here. Okay. So you can find this information at over DNA LC website. I will show you where to look later on. Okay. All right. After we finish PCR, we need to see the result. How do we visualize DNA? There's a method called gel electrophoresis, I see. And to understand how that works, I'm going to show you another video made gel by Gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis can be used to separate DNA okay. fragments. Electrophoresis uses an electric current to separate mm -hmm. different sized molecules in a porous sponge-like matrix. Smaller molecules move more easily through the gel pores than larger molecules. While at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Phil Sharp, Joe Sandberg, and Bill Sugden developed the DNA electrophoresis technique using an agarose gel made from highly purified seaweed. This could be used to separate DNA molecules, ranging from several hundred nucleotides in length to over 10,000 nucleotides. The gel is submersed in a tank filled with a salt solution that conducts electricity. Using a pipette, DNA samples are loaded into slots made in the agarose gel. Can you hear? The DNA samples are colorless, but researchers add a blue tracking dye. This makes it easier to load the samples and visually track the DNA migration through the gel. The phosphate groups in the DNA backbone carry negatively charged oxygens giving a DNA molecule an overall negative charge. In an electric current, the negatively charged DNA moves towards the positive pole of the electrophoresis chamber. The DNA molecules move through the gel by reptation, a reptile-like snaking action through the pores of the agarose matrix. Smaller DNA fragments migrate faster and further over a given period of time than do larger fragments. This is how DNA fragments can be separated by size in an electrose gel. Sandbrook and Sugden introduced the use of the fluorescent dye, ethidium bromide, to stain DNA. Ethidium bromide binds tightly to the DNA double helix and glows when illuminated with ultraviolet light. This lets researchers see where the separated DNA fragments end up. A photo of the gel can be taken for later analysis. The size of any DNA fragment can be determined by comparing it to markers. DNA fragments of known sizes. A map of restriction enzyme sites can be generated by cutting a piece of DNA with different combinations of restriction enzymes. All right. So we learned theoretically how this works. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to make a gel, okay? Um, have you ever made a gel before? Probably not, but have you ever made a jello at home before? Yes, so it's the same thing. First, uh, we need the liquid and need the sugar powder, and then you mix it and then heat it up. And then you are going to pour it into the tray, okay? And weigh it wait for it to become solidified, then you can use it, okay? So here is a gel I prepared for you. And after the gel is ready to go, you can remove the stopper and the comb here. I hope you can see my hand, okay? And there you go. Then you're ready to use, 
Okay, to set up a job box is very easy. I'm going to show you here. All right. This is a power station. This is a job box. You can uh, slide it open and please notice the job box is color coded. Red, black, red, black, red, black. And here in the power station, red, black. So we use the black for negative charge and red for positive charge. Okay, so when you put this thing in, you have to match the color, black to black, red to red, and then put it here like this. And then you need the buffer called 1XTBE buffer to run the job. We just pour it into the chamber. All right, and then you're going to load your sample, okay? After you finish your PCR, you're going to get your sample out. All right, and you're going to load it, okay? So the PCR um, products should be 25 microliters in volume, so you're going to load them out there. Uh, when you load the gel, one thing important is um, keep your eye on top of the black zone, okay? That's where uh, all the tiny wells located. And then you price to the first stop, get into the lake, get all the PCR product out. And then you use both hands to, sterile, uh, to stabilize um, macro pipetter and aim it to the uh, place and then price to the first stop. Then keep pricing back out and then change. All right, so remember when you load the gel, you only use first stop because you don't want to blow air bubble into that tiny space, okay, to lose your PCR product, your DNA sample. Very good. So um, after you finish loading the gel, you're going to put the box, put the cover back, okay, and let's see. You need to connect to the power station, all right? So... Again, match the color black to black. Oops, this one works, yeah. And right to red. Then you turn on the power station. You can set up the, uh, we're using two person gel today. And I will set up the voltage to 140. by pricing the plus arrow, okay? Or if it's too much, you price it down. Get the exact number you want, okay? And then price this big button twice. Now the light next to the clock is on. That's how you set up timer. So we're going to run the gel for 30 minutes. Uh oh okay. Then when you all set, press this button. Now you see the light is on and you see air bubbles coming from this where and that means everything's all set. Okay. Any question regarding how does gel diaphoresis work? Okay. Uh, remember, you can always go back um, the video to Watch it again for your question, or you can go directly to dnalc.org to find your answer. Okay, now, after you finish running the gel, we have to see how, that's pretending we finish the gel, okay? And then you're going to get your gel out. It'll look like this, okay? now. How can you see the DNA? Does DNA have color? No. So to see the DNA, you need a DNA dye. We use gel red this time. So what I did is when I make the agros gel, before I pour it into the tray, I put something called gel red. 
It's a DNA dye there, okay? Uh, now, the DNA should have color now, okay? Um, to visualize DNA, we need the help of UV light. I have a black light here. All right. All right, so we'll see if we can see the DNA or not. I'm just going to put it in front of the Probably very hard for you to see, right? Yeah, I can see it. All right, so might be harder for you to uh, see it uh, there, but I'm going to uh, take a picture and put on the screen, okay? All right. Okay, there you go. So that's what I saw under the UV light. You see the color, red. Now you understand why the dye is called gel red. Okay, so you see different binds, okay? And this place is a marker. Okay, this is a 400. And then you see some people have a PCR result, just one band. There's another person, the PCR result had two bands, and there's another person has one band, but it's a different size, okay? So what does this mean? How could we tell over genotype from the gel result? To understand that, um, I want to remind you about this Mandelin inheritance rule. So you see, if the mom is a heterozygote and the father is a heterozygote too, then this children could have four different possibilities for their genotype, okay? Keep in your mind, each person, you have two chromosome number 16, PV192. One from your father, one from all right? Now let's look at the gel. Remember when we do the PC, oh, maybe this will help you, okay? At the beginning, we, if you have the insertion, the insertion LU itself is about 300 BP, okay? If you don't have the insertion, PV92 locus is 415 BP. That's the size. If you do have the insertion, then you your, uh, your PCR product size should be 715 base pair lengths. Okay, keep that in mind, then it's very easy to understand the result. Okay, now let's see. If on the picture, you see just the one band around 730 base pair, okay? So that means what? Is there an insertion there? Yes, that means there's an insertion there, right? And there's no other band. That means both the chromosome number 16 you got from your mom and dad gave you the one single product, which is 700, around 700 BP. So that means you have insertion at both allele, okay? Now, if you only see one band, this student and this student, okay, at 416 BP length, what's that mean? That means you don't have the insertion, either from your father's side or from your mother's side. So you only have negative and negative. That's your genotype. Now, some people may have two bands. One is about 700 BP, one is about 400 BP. That means this person is a heterozygote. They got one positive value, one negative value. Does that make sense to you? Very good, okay. Now, that's how you find your genotype, okay? So we have this, um, Accesses for you to do. Let's see. 
So if you have one band, what you have is yours. Very good. It's manners, manners. If you have one band at 700, around 700 BP, what's your genotype? Yes, it's plus, plus, okay? If you have two bands, that means you're heterozygous, plus, minus. All right, so that's how you figure out your genotype. That's how you figure out if you have the insertion or not. Okay, now that's just one experiment for you to check out if you have insertion or not. But if you have a group of people all finish this same experiment, and then you can calculate something called the genotype frequency. I will show you how, I'm, here I'm showing you how to do the calculation, okay? Let's say you have a group of students all finish this same experiment, and find out 10 of them has positive, positive genotype, and 10 of them has a positive, negative result. And let's say uh, 30 of them has negative and negative result. Now, total 50 students. And how many alleles in, you got from this 50 students? 100, because each student have two alleles. So two times 50 equals to 100, all right? So let's figure out what's the number here. Now this, um, if the student have the genotype plus plus, that means none of the student have negative allele. So the number here should be zero times 10 equals to zero, all right? And each of the students give out two positive allele. So for 10 students, you have total 20 positive value, got it here. Now, for this group of students, each student, they are, every student in this group, they are um, heterozygous. So each one give out uh, one negative value. So the total negative value number is 10. Now, this group of students, each of them also have one positive. So the positive value from this group is one times 10 equals to 10 micro, uh, 10. All right, let's figure out what's happening here. All right, so there's 30 students in this group. They were tested as negative, negative. So each person gave out a two negative value. So 30 students, you gave out 60 negative value, okay? And none of them has positive value. So the total number of positive value from the 30 students is zero, all right? Then how do you calculate allele positive frequency? You just use um, the total number of the positive value here, 10 plus 10 plus zero is 30. So you use 30 divided by total allele number from this group and times 100%, then you got 30%. Any question regarding how to calculate allele frequency? Okay, no? Okay, so what is the use of that? Now, scientists did a lot of work and um, they go to different uh, continents and they uh, do research on modern genome, uh, population genetics. And what they found is different uh, population, they may have different allele positive frequency here. For example, so this table you can find at your worksheet, okay? So um, after we finish, you can uh, have a look. And what I want you to do is you put all the numbers from the table to the map. Put all the, for example, Taiwanese 
Uh, they had 90% ALU positive insertion rate. So we find where's Taiwan, it's here, right? So you put a 90% there, all right? And then you see uh, European Americans, they have 18% ALU positive frequency. And you know they live here, so you put 18% here on the map, all right? So that's how you do the accesses. And what kind of conclusion you can get from that? Yeah, you may say, oh, different modern population, they have different frequency. And some group tends to have a higher positive frequency. Some group has a lower one, okay? So, but that doesn't tell you much about your identity. Um, so you need more data. I said we have a million copies of a Lu insertion in the genome. So we, today we only look at one place, one locus called PV92, okay? And PV92 positive value frequency, they are different among many, many different ethnic groups. But if you check more locations, they all are ALU insertions, but they're in different, different locations. And then you can calculate more, you get more information about each specific popul modern population, what is their ALU insertion frequency in that particular location. Okay, for example, we see um, the Chinese people, PV92, you have uh, 60, 86% um, insertion um, frequency here, insertion here, and let's say Filipino has 80% uh, insertion frequency. Now, that's in PV92, but if you look at a different location, let's say um, TPA25, then you will see the Chinese people only have 35% um, insertion frequencies, well, the Filipinos has 63% of the insertion frequency. So more number, more locus you look at into, and more numbers you have, more data you have, then you have a better understanding of each uniqueness of that group. All right, so uh, Yale University Medical School has this wonderful uh, database, they're open to the public. So if you're interested to study more, to learn more, you're welcome to go to that. You can just, uh, this, is a, um, this is their website. You're welcome to take a screenshot and go back to visit when you have time, okay? So a lot of research has been done using this simple method. So today you learn a very easy experiment. You just need to wash your mouth and then uh, clack your cheek cells, then use, heat it up and use key legs to purify the DNA and then run a PCR. Then after that, you check your result on the gel. Very simple, very straightforward experiment, but they can do a lot for you if you are interested in doing genetic research, okay? So this is a publication published uh, at the Genome Research. So this group of scientists, they different location, they checked the different population and figure out, they did the same experiment you did here today, but they have more data, so they put things together and then use the uh, software um, the computer generated a map uh, of the modern population relationships here. All right, so that's all for today. Um, I hope you learn a lot. If you're really interested in this subject, um, go to our website. We have a bioserver website. Okay, and there you can do more accesses. You can use the ALU uh, server to compare different um, modern population uh, ALU frequency, insertion frequency, and see uh, how different they are. And you can also use simulation server um, to play some game. Okay, I'm going to show you um, 
if there's another um, chance, I will show you, okay, to, because the time matters, we have to wrap up. And so I want to thank you all for coming. And this is the last picture I want to show you because uh, look at here, this is three instructors at DNA Learning Center. We all look different. We have different ethnic group background. Um, we have different skin color, different hair color, different eye color, but we all have this insertion at PV92. So 200,000 years ago, we are come, we're sharing the same ancestor. So next time on the street, if you see somebody doesn't look like you, but don't forget to put a big smile on your face because that person could be your lost cousin. Am I right? Okay, thank you for coming, and I hope you had fun, and I wish we have a chance to meet again. All right.